everyone, and welcome to STEM From's podcast, Where Does Your Journey Stem From?, hosted by myself, Dr. Karina Minardi. Today, we are joined by a wonderful scientist and guest, Maria, who is currently a graduate student at New Mexico State University. Let's welcome to the stage, Maria. Hey, Maria, how's it going? Hello, everyone. Hello, everyone. Good to be here. Good to be here. So Maria was born and raised between Zacatecas, Mexico and Oakley, Idaho. She received associate degrees in chemistry, geology and physics from the College of Southern Idaho in 2017. Later, she completed her bachelor's in chemistry at Westminster University, formerly known as Westminster College in Salt Lake City, Utah in 2019. Maria also earned her master's in horticulture from NMSU in 2021 and is currently in the plant and environmental science PhD program here at NMSU. Her research explores algal strains as a food source for humans under simulated space conditions. That's really cool. Um, more specifically, Maria is ensuring a simulated environment through gravitational cancellation in a 2D plane and evaluating algal growth under liquid and solid media for vitamin and macronutrient synthesis. This research seeks to close the gap in availability of specific nutrients for homeostatic human health under a microgravity environment. When she is not in her lab or in her study as she is right now, Maria enjoys volunteering within the university and alongside her community partners. So we are so excited to have you, Maria. Um, thank you again for joining us. And usually our first question is, tell us a little bit about yourself, your background, and what drives you as a person. Thank you so much, Dr. Rinaldi. Um, it's really, really great to, to be able to share. I think we all as scientists just kind of wait for everyone to ask what we're doing and then we're ready to just like share everything. Um, but yeah, like you said, I grew up in Idaho. I actually grew up between Idaho and Zacatecas, Mexico. Um, so that stems from being from a migrant farm working family. Um, I am the youngest of five and um, that has brought many blessings and challenges. So um, two of my brothers have received um, education or some sort of education. Uh, I'm the only woman in my family that has um, gone through full education beyond high school. Um, and then um, needless to say, like beyond a bachelor's as well. Um, so that has been a really interesting um, road for everyone um, as cultural expectations arise and, you know, some questions. Um, as well from my family, from the community. Uh, I think it's just now that they start to understand like, oh, like, you know, what you do is, is important. Um, so that's sort of the background. So growing up, uh, we would spend three months, three to four months in Mexico when the potato harvest was over in Idaho. And then we'd travel over Christmas and on to um, March when, potato uh, planting was um, happening up in Idaho, which starts about April. Uh, and that's what my dad tended to do more. My mom was also a farm worker up in Idaho. Um, so my dad was in the tractor and my mom was in the cellars um, trying to, um, to work there. So it was very cold. Um, that's kind of how I grew up, a small town. Um, a predominantly white community. Um, and that's kind of how I started to shift away. Um, there were many opportunities that came up. Um, I was really scared to take them, but I did. Um, and I'm just really grateful to, to have chosen that path up until now. Well, I think you've lived um, a really cool and diverse life so far, and you've been exposed two aspects of culture that I think is a little bit of a rarity for scientists, um, if I can be so bold. Um, so I guess the the next question, and I also appreciated that you used uh, stem from in the appropriate way. So thank you for that too in your conversation. Um, but the next question that comes to mind is then, 
How did you get introduced to science? Up in two academic settings um, was so valuable and interesting. At the time, I probably didn't see it that way um, because we would actually go to school in Mexico for three months and then we'd be in the U.S. school system as our like home uh, system. Um, but, you know, in the U.S., it was like, I don't know, there was a little more freedom in some senses. Um, if we talk about like clothing, um, sort of the resources that were available to the school. Um, in Mexico, we obviously didn't have much money, so we had to make use of it wisely. You know, we had the uniforms and I wasn't the exception when I showed up. And it was just really, really fun. Um, and I actually had a dream last night about it, um, just remembering how valuable I see it now. So with that, um, how did I go into science? And, and I say that as a backstory because that was really important going into science. Um, because English is not my first language, um, I was al always really like, deficient or let's say not proficient in the English level um, when I was in elementary school. Um, so that would always like bring me down um, because I was never at the level that I should have been. And because I was at that level, um, sort of the teachers didn't also encourage that. And instead, I became good at like the math side because it was the side that would, made sense in both languages. Um, and so the math and the science sort of equilibrated. So when I came into the, to the US, I came at age six um, and that's when the, the traveling started back and forth, the US and Mexico. Um, and Science, and I was here, and I was here, at, I came in after first grade from Mexico. Then I went one year to learn English at sort of like um, a dual language school. And I came back into the normal U.S. system, but I repeated sort of second grade. Um, so when I would go to Mexico, I was actually in third when I would be here in second. So I was always a year ahead in Mexico. But in science and math, it was sort of equivalent always. So in Mexico, I really, really struggled with the history, um, as well as your accents, your little um, accents in, in the word. So that was not an area I really wanted to go into because I'm like, I. I'm not very good at it in English or Spanish, so let's just do the science. Um, and that's kind of how I just went into the science uh, curiosity, we can say. I think that's um, so cool in the fact that it's an example of the universality of math and the universality of science, um, regardless of language barriers, cultural barriers. It's, it really is the Pythagorean theorem is the theorem and whatever, you know? Um, so that's, you know, that's a really interesting perspective. So talk to me a little bit about your high school experience then as you've grown up and um, sort of how did you build this repertoire with science and STEM? So yeah, then it was, at first it was not fun because, um, you know, you were the new kid in the block and everyone just stared at you and everyone noticed you and especially in Mexico and they had ideas of who Americans were. And I was just like, oh, I don't know. My parents just sent me here to school. Don't ask me things. So it was really scary. And, um, as I got into high school, then it just like sort of became like a family um, sort of realm. Um, and I ended up 
graduating high school with more credits than any one of my peers because they'd give me like sort of half a credit every time I'd travel there for the different classes that they didn't offer here. Um, so that was really, really cool. But it was also cool in the sense of like the teaching styles, right? So in Mexico, it was a lot of writing. So the teacher would get on the board and you would copy what they're doing. And then you would have homework based on what you learned that day, which is all in your notebook. In the U.S., that's not so much. You'd have like things to fill out. So I, I definitely learn better now by writing everything I do. Um, which I know is, is pretty old school if we talk now, uh, but that's just kind of how my brain got wired. So obviously we finished high school. Um, so my peers finished high school in Mexico a year before I did, right? So I'm kind of behind, um, they're making fun of me, but um, it was fine. I graduate uh, valedictorian over in Idaho. And this was really because I was determined um, to really make my family's sacrifice worth it. Because, uh, so like I mentioned, it's five of us, but only three of us um, came to the U.S. when we all came in, in 2002. Um, and my two other siblings had some issues with, you know, age requirements to come into the U.S. and whatnot. Um, so it sort of fragmented the family in, in a way. And I was like, well, I don't really have a way to help my parents. So I should just like, you know, like school is the only way that I can succeed. And that was my mentality. Like we're, we're from a humble family. Like there's no way my parents can afford to send me to college. And if I don't get in, then I have no other choice that, you know, go back to the fields or, or find another job. I think that's admirable um, beyond anything. And it also demonstrates um, a great deal of grit and resilience. Um, because I think something that I didn't realize prior to talking with you here at the podcast is the, the transmissibility between Mexico and America, and then also the educational systems and the differences there. You know, there's one thing to say about the universality of um, sciences and mathematics, but then it's also how they teach and what resonates with you when you had to kind of go through disparate systems. Um, so, I mean, that's, I mean, props to you beyond all, all um, um, you know, reason. Um, you know, what are your, you know, taking that as an aspiration, right, of, of going into higher education, then, you know, thinking through what do you want to do um, after your PhD? And what do you see as career goals for yourself? I wasn't sure what to do after high school. Um, so I went into STEM because that's kind of how I was told I was good at it. So I was like, maybe I should start there. Um, and having gone through like this sort of rigorous STEM degree an undergrad, um, which is chemistry, I, I started to do research um, and I found some opportunities as an undergrad, um, but I really wasn't seeing the impact in the community. Um, we were working to develop some reaction for some pharmaceutical or that would eventually make it to some pharmaceutical. To this day, I don't even know what pharmaceutical that was. Um, it was just the reaction that we were focused on and we were focused on doing it under conditions that, they, that it normally wouldn't react under. Like, um, so we were trying to avoid that. Um, but I was like, oh, but like, how, it, you know, how are my parents ever gonna benefit from that? So that's when I started thinking like, oh, I want to apply chemistry in something different. Um, and then I thought back to why my family came to the US. Um, and that really is like many families, right? Um, because there was just not enough money for the whole family. Or, 
you know, affording anything was really hard. And my family also, um, already had a prickly pear farm um, in Mexico. So I was like, then why are we not using that farm? Or why does it bring no profits to the family? Um, and that was, or that is due to, you know, climate change reasons and me coming from like, oh, the science background. Then I wanted to join the two together. And I was like, well, I'm interested in chemistry applied in ag or some sort of ag aspect. And that's how I got that master's. Going into the PhD, um, we started thinking a lot more broadly um, and really thinking about the human aspect um, as to how humans actually absorb sort of nutrients um, and how nutrients are available in the human body. And I don't do work with humans, but it's sort of that idea. So I stayed with algae, uh, microalgae, and um, most people probably see as algae as like the bad guy, you know, out in the Gulf, and, like trying to kill everything, because um, that's what it's sort of famous for. Uh, but you also see algal products in um, natural food stores, like uh, spirulina is really famous for for its uh, phytochemicals and its um, superfood properties. But it's not really common, at least not in the Americas. Like you might find it more in markets in, in Asia. Um, but it's an interesting way to answer how does climate change, which gravity isn't really climate change, but it's more of a, a stressor because any living thing also goes through stress. So as, as the broader picture stress, how does that apply to zero gravity, which is not something we experience on earth? How does that influence vitamin production, which is something that humans produce or consume, I'm sorry. Um, how is that affected? And do we see it at like different concentrations and would that be still accessible to humans? And, um, a lot of people have asked me, why would you want to do something that is related outside of this world if we already have enough issues on Earth? Um, that is a common question <laughs> that I do get. But I'm interested in three vitamins. And those three vitamins have a lot to do with current human issues on Earth. And that is vitamin D with bone um, density, vitamin E, uh, which is more on the um, redox side or the radical or sort of any um, activity that's not normal. And that's where you get your, um, what, what do they call it? Antioxidants from, um, that's a, that's a hot word that people use that probably don't know what it means. So it just like normalizes cells. Um, and vitamin K um, is also of importance to us. So if we can get that um, sort of figured out in space, we can also help people here on Earth with that. Um, so beyond a PhD, I want to continue um, doing research in this realm of how is climate change affecting photosynthetic systems, whether that's algae, whether that's plants, how is their production of chemicals that can be con consumed by humans affected? Um, and that, you know, sort of ties with all the, the experiences and personal stories that um, I've had in my life. Now, I really enjoy that because I think it, it, comes full circle, right? Of understanding your childhood, your your parents, your family, and how you were introduced to agricultural and agricultural businesses, and then saying, "Hey, there's there's actually things science that I can study here, um, here on Earth and here not on Earth." Um, I think that's really cool. And as we 
I think the other piece there is that it's not just human consumption, right? It's all mammalian consumption or animal consumption, whatever you want to say. Plus, it's the idea of your your research is really seminal to the ability of exploration beyond Earth, right? And the usage there. I think that's really cool. So do you want to work for like Elon Musk? Is that <laughs> or do you want to work for federal governments? Like, give me a little bit more. Um you know, I'm really open to it. I think that's always been sort of my mentality, even coming into graduate degrees. Just give me what you got. Let's try it and see what happens. Um, I keep saying I don't want to stay in academia beyond a PhD, but I shouldn't say that anymore. Like, I really should just stop because the next thing you'll know is you, you'll find me as a, an assistant professor somewhere out there. Um I honestly just enjoy doing the research. I enjoy like doing community outreach. Um, that is like the highlight of my year if I have to present on that. Uh, I get to go and take microscopes and show people like what algae look like under the microscope. The amount of people that have never seen anything under the microscope is crazy. And so it's really exciting. Um, to just be like, oh, you want, it, even if it's not algae, like, oh, like, do you want to look at, like, I think we did an activity with undergrads not too long ago where we looked at onion cells under the microscope. Um, so that's the part that I really like. Um, so whatever allows me to do that, I'll do that. <laughs> no, that's, that's great. Um, I had, I recorded an episode yesterday um, and the Caitlin's introduction to science was her parents gave her a microscope for Christmas. And so she said, oh, I looked at everything. I even sneezed on a lens and then made, <laughs> I looked at it. I was like, that is great. That is just pure gold. Um, so you said onion cells. I love it. That's so G rated in comparison. Um, so let's actually delve a little bit into your science because I want to know a little bit of like what your hypotheses are. What are you looking at now? How do you actually look at vitamin D, E, K, uh, concentrations. Interestingly enough, my PhD project is much more broad than common PhD projects. And I can't tell if that's good or bad yet. And we'll figure that out soon. So I have three main objectives in my PhD. So the first one um, is before we get started, eventually we want to see space conditions, right? So how do we get that? And that is validating, making a proof of concept, whatever you want to call it, showing that I have a microgravity system. Um, so we're currently using roots to validate that. Um, and you may be wondering what the system looks like. Um, and if I showed you, maybe some people would laugh because it's a motor that turns dishes, like Petri dishes, in one direction. So it's a two-dimensional plane, like you said in the intro, um, and it spins at a 90-degree angle. So if you have like a, like a Petri dish, imagine it on its side. You see them normally probably laying on its, um, you see like the top or the bottom, but these lay on its side and they rotate very slowly. Uh, when I say very slowly, I mean like four revolutions per hour. So four turns per hour. So if you're not paying attention, you're going to think that it's not moving. Um, and why are we doing this? So we're, we actually know from previous research that the root tip area of a seedling is really sensitive to gravitational forces, whether they're present or not. So at true microgravity, these gravitational forces are not there. 
and the directionality of where the root is going is lost. So on earth, we see roots down into the soil, shoots, or the higher plant out, up. We don't see that in true microgravity, at least for the root zone. Um, so the root could just grow any direction it wanted to. So we then take samples into the lab. We kind of slice the root tip and we look at certain cells that actually have heavy starches and those start to rearrange or don't rearrange. So it depends what, what you're looking at. Um, and that's what we're working on for the simulation validation. Um, for the second aim, so now that we say, we still don't say that, but if we say, okay, we got a system that works, now we're interested in looking at algae that hopefully produce these vitamins and place them on the simulator and see what happens. Do their concentrations change or not? Um, currently, we're under the process of developing analytical methods under chromatography for um, triple, quadruple, uh, for all the, the chemists out there. Um, to just be able to detect the vitamins. So we're in that phase. Um, next week, I'll be starting experiments within the algae to see how they produce these vitamins um, under normal lab bench. Like how do they perform just in their everyday life cycles um, and take them at different stages of their life and see if their concentrations concentration changes over their lifespan, which is about three weeks. Um, and um, that's what's currently happy, happening right now. The third aim of my research looks at um, sort of a sustainable idea of, okay, well, if we were to take microalgae into space, well, what if you had micro uh, algae left over? Um, what can you do with it? So the idea behind this, this aim is that um, in space, you have a matrix, um, which we'll call it a space soil for lack of a better word. Um, so you have the structural support, but you don't have the nutritional components. So it's sort of like a lava rock kind of material. Well, what if we looked at the degrading process of algae, which we know coexist with bacteria, is the concentration of bacteria enough to degrade algae and have support nutritional support for something that could be seeded there, um, like higher plants. So now we'd be introducing nutrients to the support that's already there. So we're looking at um, the bacterial concentrations or um, for a bigger general aspect, microbiome of algae to see if, if there's areas to look at for decomposition or mineralization rates is a, it's a more specific word to say that. So I'm, I'm going to ask a non-serious question first, and then I'll, I'll actually proceed with a rather serious question. The first non-serious question is, um, did you ever see the Matt Damon movie, The Martian? And is that kind of what you're doing? I have not actually. I was going to say yes, but it was only interstellar. Um, I have not seen that movie. No. But <laughs> so I can't comment. Sorry. <laughs> no, it's fine because he he essentially is stranded on Mars and he has to use a variety of different. Um, what did you say? Matrices in order to see plant growth 
on Mars and how did he actually do that? Um, so, and it was actually a book before it became a movie. So maybe you should read that because I think it's really appropriate. Now, proceeding back to the serious nature of this podcast, um, other than movie references, do you anticipate, so you have three aims. Um, they're all aims, objectives, whatever you want to call them. I mean, they're pretty substantial. It's a substantial amount of work between the system, between the actual um, analytical methodologies, the LCMS method development for vitamin concentration, and then obviously then looking at the, the matrix. Um, do you think you're going to get to all three of them by the end of your PhD and or can you do them in parallel or is there, are they actually sequential? So um, before I answer your second question, I do have to say um, there are people that are doing research currently with soil from space, from Mars, from the moon, I believe, to see if plants grow in that type of soil. The difference is they bring it back to earth and now you've introduced oxygen um, into it. So they, they're able to, to successfully grow those. Um, so I just don't want anyone to say like, oh, that hasn't already been done. I acknowledge it has been done. What I'm looking at is the algal microbiome decomposition part. Work on it um, sequentially. So I could be, I will be starting the microbiome work soon. Um, and that is because I was NASA funded for that. And I have a presentation in April, so I at least have to start it. <laughs> um, but the other two, I, I'm bringing on an undergraduate to help me with the first sort of validation. He's a horticulture student um, that is really interested in the seed part. So he'll be helping me with um, just getting those experiments um, done. And those really take about a week each, you know, to see if you successfully um, have, have seen any progress. Um, and then we take them to the microscope and, and do that work there. Uh, but my main focus right now is the algal part um, because um, we don't know at what con concentrations the vitamins are currently at and if we need to be looking at um, inhibition of some biosynthetic pathway to produce them. Um, and that will take a lot more time. So that's my main focus. Um, I think I will touch on all three. If not, I'm hoping to, you know, do the first two aims well um, and leave sort of groundwork for the third aim um, for someone else, maybe in the lab that is interested. Well, there's always work to be done. I mean, I mean that's that's for sure. Um, that's really, really cool. Um, and they're NASA funded. So that's even cooler because then you have an actual reason and, and funding plus time is of the essence because you got to prove to them that you're using the funds appropriately. You know, the whole, that. Yeah. So we're, we're ending our, our time here and I want to ask you my commonly, uh, sort of my ending question so that if you were to reflect on short of your career thus far, and if you were to talk to um, either yourself 10 years ago or someone else that is thinking about pursuing a PhD, you know, in high school. I mean, what would be your words of wisdom for them? Oh, that is such a good question. A deep question. <laughs> um, because I was actually reflecting about this this morning, ironically. Um, something that I... I would tell them is don't follow what people think you should be doing. Follow what you like to do. Um, and that can be really hard. And I obviously speak as a success story, but I can definitely see that like 
as a huge, huge sort of hold back for many people up to this day. Those are really powerful words because I think all too many times students are, they have external pressures and internal pressures, frankly, um, of saying, you need to do this, you need to accomplish this. Um, and I mean, when we were connecting prior to the podcast, you spoke a little bit about your family not understanding, you know, why you're doing a PhD. And I think that that is really words of wisdom too, because it's, there's also the flip side of that. You know, you, some parents expect their kids to be doctors and then there are those parents who don't. And then, so, you know, you got to follow your own path and forge your own path. Right. Well, and it's even hard now. Um, <laughs> it's a funny story. I'll tell it because I think he would be okay with it. And it's the story of the day I told my dad I would be entering a PhD program. And it was over the phone because, you know, some things you just don't do in person. <laughs> and um, I was already in New Mexico and I was like, well, I'm doing a doctorate degree. Uh, in Spanish, It's it's not a very common terminology if not you're you're if you're not referring to a medical doctor he's like well you don't even like blood and i was like no i'm not gonna be a human doctor he's like well you don't like animals and i'm like no i'm not gonna be a vet and he's like well what are you gonna be a doctor for and i'm like i'm gonna be a doctor of plants and he's like i'm not gonna say it um but in translation, he said, he's like, I'm not stupid. There's no such doctors. What are you going to do? <laughs> and I remind him now, and he's like, I still have my doubts that there's such doctors. So it's a, it's a continual, you know, understanding from both sides and me teaching um, him and my family, like, what this really means, because I don't even know what it means some days. Um, but yeah, you're right. There, I, I was expected to be, you know, one of four, like, either go into med school, become a lawyer, the common expectations. Aren't you happy you didn't? And aren't you happy you're working for NASA? I mean, come on. <laughs> <laughs> well, with that, Maria, I, I thank you. Um, for being a guest and for sharing your story and your perspective, I think is so, so cool and so rich. Um, and so many people could benefit from listening to it. Um, so there's that. Um, so thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Renate. Thank you for the work you do uh, for providing the platform to be able to speak and, and be just the path uh, for others. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Yeah. Well, thank you. That was really kind words. Um, and to all of our listeners out there, thank you for listening and tuning in. And never forget to ask yourself, where does your journey stem from? Bye, everyone. <laughs>